I want to welcome everyone once again to the West Kitsap Way Transportation Study virtual presentation. Um, this is our third virtual presentation. Um, so we are very pleased this evening to share some new information about the project with you. Um, <clears throat> and we hope that um, you find the information you're looking for. Um, with us tonight is, uh, my name is Katie Ketterer. I'm with the city of Bremerton as the project manager. We also have some folks from our project team, uh, John Davies from KPG, Natalie Graves from um, SNA Communications, and Laya Marsloff from um, SNA. So thank you all very much. Um, and we will go ahead and get into the presentation. So tonight, uh, we have some new information, as I said, to share with you all. Um, first, we're going to review the study background and purpose um, really quickly. To, if this is your first time learning about the West Kitsap Way Transportation Study, we'll get you up to speed a little bit. Um, and then we're going to dive into our preferred alternative um, and, and what we have um, selected for this this um, corridor. And we'll have a question and answer session towards the end, uh, talk about next steps, and um, finish up by, by about seven o'clock. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John um, to start going through the presentation. John? Thank you, Katie. Um, so my name is John Davies, and I'm the project manager on the, the consultant team that's helping out the city. And as we know, uh, Kitsap Way is an important corridor. And our study corridor is basically running between State Route 3 and the Chico North Lake Way uh, intersection. And this corridor really provides homes to businesses, uh, or provides connections to businesses, parks, and connects people between Bremerton and locations north in Kitsap County. Now, this roadway is a city street, but it was kind of designed originally as a highway, and it's really been replaced functionally um, by State Route 3, uh, which provides a parallel corridor for people driving. But today, um, Kitsap Way carries about 11,000 people each day um, on this section. And that's in comparison, there's quite, there's like three times as many if you go on Kitsap Way to the east um, of State Route 3 going into the city of Bremerton. So just, you know, kind of get that in your heads a little bit. And this stretch of uh, Kitsap Way really has a, a bunch of uh, issues. It's, you know, it's really old. Um, it's cracked. As you drive on it, you get to hear all sorts of little thumpity thumps. Um, it really doesn't have any pedestrian facilities. There's only a couple small stretches of sidewalks. There are no bicycle facilities. Um, so bikes and pedestrians pretty much walk along the shoulder of the roadway. Uh, the, there's only one crosswalk, I believe, um, uh, in, in the middle of this corridor. And so that makes it really kind of difficult to go across um, Kitsap Way, particularly if you're trying to like go to a bus stop. Um, the design has two lanes in each direction and wide shoulders. And that really encourages people to drive probably a little bit faster than they should. And the corridor doesn't have any kind of left turn lanes. So most um, most people are trying to make a turn out of a through lane. And that really creates a, a few safety concerns at particularly where we have the roadway approaching a street intersection or a, a major driveway. So um, 
the project um, is funded by a federal surface transportation grant. And right now we're kind of in the uh, study and planning phase of the, the corridor's future improvements. So the city decided that this segment of Kitsap Way really needs to be reconstructed and wanted to evaluate how best to meet current and, uh, and future needs of the Kitsap Lake community. Um, the purpose of this study is to develop a set of recommendations that are going to improve safety, add pedestrian and bicycle facilities, increase access to transit, and provide access to properties, and also potentially accommodate some future growth on the corridor. The end result of this effort will be a preliminary design and a implementation plan on kind of how we can uh, guide the future design and development of the corridor. Um, so here's a kind of an overview of the schedule. In 2022, we kind of got going. We held our first open house in December, and that was focused on when uh, really to hear your concerns and thoughts about the corridor. Uh, we then developed a set of alternatives for Kitsap Way, which we presented at the second open house in June 2023. Since that time, we've been working hard on developing a preferred alternative, which is really the subject of tonight's presentation and the focus of our third open house, which, uh, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, we've got a the, the little web address down there. So um, if you can check it out. Um, we, we have all sorts of additional information out for the third open house. Um, in the next couple of months, we're going to review any kind of input and feedback that we have on the preferred alternative. And from there, we'll um, be producing our final report uh, probably early in 2024. Um, so in case you missed the second open house, we, what we did there is we, um, we developed three alternatives for Kitsap Way. And we really sort of had sort of a low, medium, and high alternatives. Um, all of them, these alternatives include a major reconstruction of Kitsap Way with, uh, and alternative A really focused on improvements that could be done with a, a bit of a lower cost. Alternative B added some additional features with some added cost to it. And alternative C really added, you know, kind of more of the Cadillac version of more improvements, but also had um, higher costs. And these alternatives really helped us study a range of improvements for the corridor with the idea that the final preferred alternative could really be a combination of elements from each of these alternatives. Throughout the process, we were guided by um, the six um, criteria that are shown below. I'm not gonna kind of read through them all, but really those were really our guiding principles as we were developing both the alternatives and and also in evaluating those alternatives. So what did we hear from our second open house? Well, when we presented these alternatives, um, we didn't ask participants which of the three alternatives they liked best, but rather which elements of each alternative they preferred. Uh, feedback from the open house showed really strong community preference for the center turn lane, um, shared use pathways, uh, roundabouts at Chico and Harlow and the Austin intersections. And the feedback also indicated that certain items weren't in favor, such as a big multi-lane roundabout at the SR3 Auto Center Way intersection or a traffic signal at the Chico North Lake intersection. 
So we took all that information and developed a preferred alternative, which includes elements in the end, it includes elements from all three alternatives and really does reflect that feedback from the public. So let's dive into this preferred alternative. Um, our goal really when we started this project is to make Kitsap Way feel and function more like a city street, whereas today it really feels like it's a highway. Um, the preferred alternative will include one travel lane in each direction and adds a center turn lane that will help people make left turn movements. Now, we heard some concerns about whether traffic growth can be accommodated with fewer lanes. And we really took this seriously and we used the latest city and regional models. And we determined that um, there was quite a bit of excess capacity and that one lane in each direction is expected to be able to accommodate uh, all the growth in the corridor. Um, this three-lane section will really make the corridor a lot safer, and it also provides space for landscape buffers and facilities uh, for people who are walking and rolling along the corridor. As the Kitsap Way approaches the SR3 interchange, we are giving a, back a little bit of, of additional capacity for the interchange, and we're going to widen it out to two lanes in each direction just for that little segment as we're approaching the interchange, just to help make that um, intersection, which is really important, operate as well as possible. Uh, so I'm going to describe the preferred alternative in three main segments, and we're going to start first with Kitsap Junction which is really the segment that goes between the Chico North Lake intersection and the Harlow Drive intersection. Next slide. So with in Kitsap Junction, the preferred alternative includes the three lane section for vehicles, uh, a landscape buffer with shared use pathways on both sides of the street, in the blue boxes on, uh, on this graphic, um, we're gonna have parking aisles, which would really be very slow speed access roads that dr drivers would use to access parking areas and driveways for nearby businesses. Uh, next slide. So looking at this plan view, the alternative includes roundabouts at each end of the corridor. Um, one of the things that uh, we liked about having the roundabouts is it really would slow people down as they approach uh, the Kitsap Junction. It also uh, really facilitates people, particularly we heard a lot of people who live on Harlow Drive and who say it's really difficult making a left turn. All this with a roundabout will make it a lot easier. Um, what, what we can see that there's uh, shared use pathways running along uh, each, both the north and the si south side of the corridor. And um, there's uh, the parking aisles there, which will access the, the, the parking areas um, for buildings on both sides of the street. Um, crosswalks, we're going to have crosswalks on both sides of uh, at all, uh, both roundabouts. There will be a lot more crossing opportunities and we'll be looking at where to place a mid-block crossing as well. Next slide. So the second segment runs basically from Harlow Drive to another roundabout up, up at Austin Lyle Avenue. Um, the preferred alternative um, includes a roundabout um, at the Austin Lyle Drive, 
and um, and as we can see in this cross section, we're we have that three lane section. We've got the buffers for landscaping, and we also have shared use pathways on both sides of the street. Uh, next slide. So one of the advantages of having this roundabout at the Austin Drive intersection is it kind of will also allow traffic to slow down sort of midpoint along this entire corridor. Um, uh, it's very difficult making left turns from Austin Drive. We heard that and the, the roundabout will facilitate those movements. One of the other benefits of a roundabout at this location is we can kind of bring Lyle Avenue in pretty much on its existing alignment. And so we don't have to do something where we're buying a piece of property to um, bring that leg of the intersection in and, and move Lyle to kind of square up the intersection. Um, this reduces a whole lot of property impacts, reduces some costs, and um, is, is really one of the benefits of a roundabout at this location. Um, our final segment is the long stretch that goes basically from the Austin Lyle roundabout down to um, the SR3 off-ramp at Auto Center Way. Here we're creating a separated downhill bike lane next to a walkway on the west side of the street. And the idea here is we're gonna separate faster moving bicycles who've got gravity pulling them downhill from people who are either moving more slowly or from pedestrians. Um, on the other side of the street, we kept a shared use pathway um, where bicycles are going to be moving more slowly and be able to mix in with traffic. Um, that's really the, the primary difference of this segment versus the other segment between Harlow and Austin. We just had shared use pathways on both sides of the street. Um, So um, at this segment here, we're also doing some other improvements. Um, at Wilmot Street, this is where we're going to transition to two lanes in each direction. The bike lanes are going to move to being on-street bike lanes, which tie into the existing bike lanes at the interchange. We'll also keep white walkways on both sides of the street. We did have a limitation here. Um, basically, there is a, a culvert that runs underneath Kitsap Way that so, and it kind of drops off on either side at a very steep grade. So we weren't able to widen out as much as we'd like. And we're also trying to fit in that extra fourth lane here. Um, so one of the challenges there was how do we get that widening in um, because we do, we really felt it was important to make sure we had enough lanes coming into the SR3 intersection in order that it could operate uh, very efficiently. We are also making a small change at the uh, auto, uh, at the SR3 ramps where today one of the two lanes that turns left is actually a through lane shared with a left turn lane. And we're gonna have two dedicated left turn lanes. And that also improves some intersection efficiencies and operations there. Um, next slide. I wanna highlight some of the other improvements along some of the other intersections in this segment. So at Birchfield Drive, we're gonna add a northbound left turn lane um, 
we'll probably have a crosswalk just to the north of the intersection. And um, one of the things that we decided that we really needed to do was restrict eastbound uh, traffic to right turns only. Um, this is really mainly due to um, some of the site distance issues at the, this intersection. And we did feel that with the roundabout um, to the north up at Lyle, um, that people wouldn't be too inconvenienced um, if they really needed to turn left. Um, the second one here is Crawford Drive, um, where we're going to do some improvements with new bus pullouts and a flashing beacon crosswalk um, so people can get across the street right now. This is a, a, a pretty um, heavily used um, area with um, people crossing to get to the bus stops on either side of the street. At Wilmont Street, um, the preferred alternative really made an effort to square up um, Wilmont, Wilmont Street at the angle that it comes into Kitsap Way. And we're also adding left turn lanes. So hopefully um, at Wilmont Street, it will be a lot safer for people who are um, coming in and out um, as opposed to the way it is today where it's kind of coming in at an angle and people start turning pretty early and, and really fly through that intersection. So overall, um, we believe the preferred alternative will improve um, this corridor and that the street will be safer for all users and will hopefully meet the needs of the community for years to come. Um, we're now gonna open up the meeting to any questions you have or any comments. Yes, and I'm uh, Natalie once again. I'm going to help kind of field some of these questions as they're coming in. Uh, I first wanted to call out uh, Michael Butts. He has his had his hand up for a while. I don't know if you're intending or if you have a question. I'm going to allow you to speak for a second, Michael. Um, okay. Okay. There you go. All set. Yeah, actually, I, I clicked that hand up a long time ago. <laughs> it wasn't wasn't for a question, but. But I do have a question. Okay. Um, I'm I'm the uh, lot, of, the last business lot across from the Red Apple Market. It won Eaters Tacos. It was one of my tenants, so I, most people know that area. Uh, will I'm anxious to see this. The sidewalks look great and everything, but how will that affect my parking? We've got a really tight parking area. One Eaters. It's an old gas station. It was built close to the road back in 1939. I think I'm the I'm the second owner of that property. I've owned it for 40 years, but second owner. Um, I just I would hate to see his business be hindered because he's got a pretty thriving little business there. Um, will the will the the development um, take more take any of my land that would normally I'd use for parking? So, so the design of this project really is fitting within the um, this city's designated right of way, which um, I know in Kitsap Junction, part of that area has been used over, you know, traditionally has been used for parking. Um, that's one of the it's one of the challenges to to this uh project and it's something that as the project moves further into the design of um this project we're going to really need to take a close look at each of the parcels at within the Kitsap Junction area and try to figure out, okay, what are the trade-offs? What could we do differently? 
versus the way that things are done today um, and be able to have um, some of those um, conversations. One of the reasons why we chose this particular configuration was that Juanitos also has a drive-through. And um, we looked at some other options and that drive-through really couldn't quite work in the same way. And so we were trying to come up with some other ideas, but that will be something that we'll want to work with you very closely on as we move into a design process and make sure that we can probably get you know the, the best possible solution but um you know there there will be some trade-offs in in terms of parking you know where if you've got you know five people pulling in at 90 degrees um and it's built right by the edge of you know the the property line um you know we may not get all those spaces back so yeah i'm actually i'm anxious to work with you on that uh and have input uh my building when it was constructed is is uh with is is too close to the right away for any modifications to the building uh, about 25 years ago i tried to just put a a window for drive up and the existing building wasn't able to so so I'd have some, would need some help with city uh, building department also, maybe if we did need to alter something, it's an, I think it's considered an existing non-conforming use mm -hmm. now <laughs> is what my building is. So if, you know, if you were to change the drive through or parking, I'd hopefully uh, you guys would help me. <laughs> yeah. Help, help me with some variances, maybe just because it's there. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we've, we've definitely worked on a few projects. Um, like we, we worked up in Silverdale um, and um, on Silverdale way where some of those improvements went in there up by where the feed store is and really worked closely with the feed store, which was another building that, you know, was had, you know, a lot of challenges and the, you know, we worked closely with them and we figured out some solutions to it. So that's that's something that, you know, the, the city and um, the design team um, moving forward will be taking a hard look at those. Okay, I appreciate you. it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. And I think, you know, if you registered for this, we have your email, um, but I also encourage you, if you haven't, to feel welcome to email Katie. Her email will be at the end of this to kind of make that connection. So thank okay. you. Okay, we have Melvin's comment was a, a pedestrian bicycle traffic count taken during the study. If so, what were the counts? I think the 11,000 number is for car counts, if I'm not mistaken. And you would be correct that um, the 11,000 are vehicle counts, um, and that's on a daily basis. We do have, we, we did do some counts related to the uh, number of people who during um, peak periods. So we looked at a, a morning peak period and an evening period peak period and we look at that because that's when the traffic's kind of at its highest and so we did get some counts uh information from that of how many people during those periods but uh one of the things that we know or and we've always had experience with is there is a little bit of if you build a nice um facility for that bicycles or pedestrians feel comfortable using, then you start seeing the numbers of people using those facilities go way up. And right now, um, you know, walking along that shoulder is not, or riding a bike on that shoulder, a lot of people aren't willing to do that just because they don't feel comfortable and they feel that they, one of the measurements we use is this idea of level of stress. And you really do feel a certain amount of stress 
on Kitsap Way with cars zooming by you and really you're just feet away from vehicles and it's 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 not a real comfortable environment so okay thank you uh, another question we have is what does the bike ped separator look like so that would probably be um defined as part of the um if, if as we move into the design, some of the the ones that I've seen and and um, that have been kind of effective um, is either it's something that will show a change in a pavement style. So, like if the rest of the pavement looks a you know a certain color, then it will be something that will pop out as a different color it could be something as simple as um, striping things like that um, some jurisdictions do little things such as um, either raise the bike facility up a teeny bit or lower it a little bit a teeny bit um, just to sort of show there is a difference um, on that so those 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 are some of the things that um, could be considered, but we're we're not really that far along in the process when um, we're really trying to get an idea of the the concept of what we might be building on this corridor. Great. We have several more. I have another one uh, asking. Currently, there are a number of vehicles parking on street near Pendleton Place and trucks at the Baymont Inn. What are the provisions planned for on-street parking? I'll take this one, John. Um, <clears throat> so this corridor is, because of the, um, the, the functional classification, <clears throat> it will not provide on-street parking. Um, so those that are using the, the right-of-way um, as parking will, um, will need to find other places to park. Cool. Another one, this one's about funding. So maybe this is for you, Katie. How are these improvements funded? So the um, the grant for that we're using right now is a, is a federal service transportation grant and it's for this planning phase, which is about the 10% um, uh, conceptual design. Um, future phases of the project have not been funded yet. So we will be um, pursuing funding, most likely, you know, federal and state grants over mm -hmm. the next, um, you know, five, 10 years um, to get, to put all of the funding together for this project. All right, another one asks, I'm curious when the study was performed to determine this corridor uses 50% of the roadway. Uh, was it conducted during COVID when there was a lot less traffic? Also, does the 50% take into consideration the peak travel times, um, considering shipyard morning and afternoon traffic? John, you wanna talk about when the tra traffic counts and what the traffic model links is. Yeah, so um, we got the traffic counts um, were conducted, I believe back in 2022, um, kind of the, as the, the post COVID period, I, I, and a lot of people look at it that way. Um, there's, um, one of the things that we also have done is we've gone back and we've looked at other studies, other plans that have been done in the area um, and just making sure that our volumes are in line with their volumes and everything seems to check out. Um, and so in terms of the existing information, um, we collected that. In terms of the peak hour, um, we do do 
individual counts at intersections. So we count, we counted, uh, I believe, 10 intersections, or maybe it's 11 intersections up and down the corridor. Um, and we got that level of information um, where we've got every individual turning movement. So we know how many people are coming, say, um, you know, making a southbound left and how many people are trying to make a westbound right and how many people are making an eastbound left. So, and how many people are going through. So we get all this information. Um, we collect, you know, what is kind of a fairly robust set of data in order to, to make these decisions. And we're not really making the decisions um, 100% on what we're seeing today. We're also looking ahead and we use 2050 as our forecast year. So we've got, we have um, future year forecasts that we're using in terms of our analysis. All right. Um, another question I asked, when, uh, what do you anticipate the speed limit being on Kitsap Way after these changes? Um, you know, I believe today it's 35 miles per hour. Um, we actually did do a speed analysis out there and in two locations, and most people drive um, more than 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. Um, so it's uh, certainly, um, you know, I think the average speed out there is like 42 miles per hour. So um, right now, um, in terms of our planning analysis for it, we have proposed lowering that speed limit. That's something that um, we'll get into to design um, as part of the design parameters because every little aspect of uh, engineering design is going to be based on sort of what what the speed is for the corridor. So we, you know, we could go down to 30 or something along those lines um, very easily um, as part of the redesign of the corridor. But that's, you know, we're, we're kind of like, like I said, we're sort of in that conceptual um, point and, um, but um, we haven't really made that decision and, and we'd really want to be working with the city um, to discuss that at length. Great. Um, it looks like there are a couple questions about Wilmot Street. Uh, why not a roundabout at Wilmot or any other additional plans for improving traffic flow at that area? Yeah, and Wilmot, one of the things that we really saw um, when we were out in the field and observing the, the traffic is really that need for having um, most of the people are coming from the interchange and they're making a left turn onto Wilmot. That's that's one of the big primary moves uh, movements there. We do, saw maybe only one or two people um, who would kind of decide that they're going to leave from Wilmot and make that turn to the to the north. Um, so one of the things with that we have to be able to do, particularly um, when we're doing intersection improvements, is there we really need to figure out what are those what 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 are the needs of the intersection and and how can we best address them so having that turn lane and adding that that turn lane so people can get out of the flow of traffic and wait in, for a gap in traffic will really help um, the safety of um, that intersection the the other thing we did is we kind of bent Wilmot down to kind of square it up a little bit and that will also help everything from people not having to kind of look over the shoulder to see if someone's coming down the hill um, 
And so that those are uh, two aspects where uh, we're going to try to uh, really make Wilmot, you know, it's the priority for Wilmot was it was to really make it safe um, for people. I'd like to add a little bit to that and um, just we did take a look, a, a pretty hard look at Crawford and in looking at if a roundabout um, would work in that location. Um, and, you know, currently and and it, um, even in the future, the there weren't um, that many trips on Crawford that um, really justified putting in a in a roundabout at that location, but we do think that one could could work um, or would work if there's more development on Crawford Drive and there's more traffic on Crawford Drive in the future. So um, I think between Wilmot and Crawford, it would be more likely in the future for there to be a roundabout added at Crawford due to um, you know, growth rather than Wilmot. Okay, we have a couple questions that are um, related to funding again, but timing of funding and timing of these improvements. One is a reaction to, wow, you know, five to 10 years for funding. What is realistic for when these projects may get started or when the community might actually see these improvements? And then on top of that, someone was asking about you know, estimated start date and how that, will that affect property taxes? I don't know if you can answer that or not, but. Yeah, I can kind of um, break those down a little bit. Um, yes, <clears throat> five to 10 years. Um, it does take time for, for us to um, get in the queue for, for funding. We, um, Funding is usually several years out, and um, we put put together grant applications, um, and and then you know if we win if we win the grant, then it still takes another you know year or so to actually get the funding and get started on the project. So um, these improvements will take time uh, before we start to to see it come to fruition. Um, and it's a it's a it's a large corridor as well. So um, there's going to be some um, prioritization that needs to take place within the corridor, breaking it into smaller pieces, and then deciding which smaller piece needs to get done, um, you know, first. Um, <clears throat> and so it it will be a multi it it will be a multi year um, project for sure. Um, I do not have an estimated start date for, for this project, uh, you know, as, um, you know, based on all, all of those unknowns for, for future grants, um, will it affect your property taxes? Um, I don't, uh, I don't believe so. I mean, we're not proposing at this point um to do any kind of like special improvement district to pay for it or um or anything like that so um the the improvements would be funded by um uh, by grants um one caveat to that is um um when properties redevelop um or develop they are required to um put in the frontage improvements that um are planned for the city. So um, if you have a property along Kitsap Way um, that's that's going to be redeveloped, then you would be um, we you would be needing to put in um, the the sidewalks um, that we're proposing um, or the uh, pathways and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> But those those that's not a new requirement. Those requirements are in place right now. Um, it's just that you would have to um, you would have to conform with this plan that we currently have, um, rather than you know just a, a blanket standard that we have for that that um, road type. 
Um, I think that covered all of the the questions. Uh huh. And it, you know, if if it doesn't, they're they're welcome to call or email you right at any time yes. to dive into it. Um, we have a couple more, and I want to make sure we have time for just next steps and close out. But we have three that I wanted to go through. One is just a comment from uh, Melvin. He's the owner of one of the commercial buildings close to the Red Apple. He would like to see more street parking so they could increase the potential for economic growth in the area for tenants. Just a comment there. And then we have another one about, you know, roundabouts can be made safer for bikes and pedestrians. This will be a popular corridor that will attract more walkers and bikers. What sort of safety amendments will you consider for the crossings at the roundabouts, especially at Austin Drive? Yeah, and, um, you know, the, there are some some sort of design parameters that um, typically are put into place what, that are based on uh, volumes, the speed limit of the facility, and um, sort of what's connecting to what. Um, so um, there is a certainly a potential for putting sort of a, a, a beacon protected um, crosswalk um, a little bit like um, you see up by Harlow today, where you know you push the button and the little lights go off. Um, those are because we have a three lane section, the distance that a pedestrian is needing to cross and the, and needing to stop those vehicles is a little bit um, shorter and it's a little easier to get across. The other thing with a roundabout is you the way roundabouts are designed is they sort of have a little built-in refuge island. So um, it's very easy to find a break in one direction of traffic, walk to the center refuge area, and then be able to cross again to the other side of the street. So those are those are some things that um, we'll need to uh, be investigated moving forward. Typically, um, you'd probably see those beacons a little bit more on the um, for crossing Kitsap Way, and uh, and they're probably not going to be on the parts where, um, for example, for example, um, on a side street, um, it might not have a a beacon control on that. I'm going to ask two more questions and then we're going to pass it off to Katie. Um, many people walk around Kitsap Lake and the Kitsap Lake Loop Trail was described in the 2007 non-motorized plan. Will you provide a seamless walk between Harlow and West Kits Kitsap Lake Road along North Lake Way on the lake side of the road, the south side of Kitsap Way? Um. You want to go ahead on that, Katie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we uh, definitely kept in mind that uh, that long-term plan for some kind of um, loop around Kitsap Lake. That's one of the reasons why we have a wider um, pathway on that side of the street or shared use path to um, accommodate what we hope will be, you know, even more users who who are, are on that, that loop trail. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we really tried to um, consider the access points on Kitsap Way, those businesses, and try and avoid having, um, you know, too many cross, you know, crosswalks along that, that side of the road. So, um, I, um, you know, that kind of cut down on that. And then I think there was a little bit about North Lake Way um, and, um, you know, I think we have in the concept, like how they would connect, um, but the improvements are on Kids Up Way. So they don't, um, they don't continue down North Lake Way. 
at least for this, you know, this conceptual study. Okay, we've had some really great questions. I'm going to throw in a last question that's going to kind of transition us, but um, since so many people within the community have gotten very engaged in this and have um, lots to contribute, um, you know, even though our study is coming to an end at the end of the year, early 2024, um, Katie, can you shed some light on how there might be more opportunities in the future years as it goes through design for the community to weigh in? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm so sorry. I have just a little bit of a cough. Um, yeah, so um, there's there's more opportunity to comment and participate at this stage of the study. So, um, you know, tonight's virtual presentation um, to have kind of a, a, a an opportunity to get some live questions. We also have an online open house. I provided the link to that in the webinar chat. Um, so you're welcome to check that out. It's kind of an opportunity to zoom in a little bit more and um, look, take a closer, longer look at the corridor and provide some comments there. Um, when we um, uh, draft up this uh, preferred alternative, um, we're gonna we're gonna uh, take in take on board your feedback here and and through the online open house process, make any final final adjustments, um, you know, address some things, and then and then we'll be going to uh, the city council with. Um, for them to actually adopt the preferred alternative. So there will be an opportunity um, through that process for folks to comment. Um, and then as we do with, with all of our um, design and construction projects, we, we do have a public process for those as well. So, um, you know, in particular for, for folks who um, own property or businesses, um, or, you know, live a, right along the corridor, um, you know, once that segment of the corridor goes under design, um, there would be a lot more coordination, direct coordination um, to make sure that, you know, like driveways and everything like that match in, because we're not getting to that detail at this point in this study. Um, and then there will be a, a larger public opportunity for, for folks um, to to kind of chime in again um, on needs because the needs do change. We recognize that. So, um, you know, if we're getting to a project five years from now, um, we know we need to go back out and make sure that um, that we're meeting the current needs for for the community. I think that kind of wrapped up all the next steps. I think so. <laughs> Uh, so there's mm -hmm. another um, uh, link there to the uh, the, the study web page. Um, and we have a completely voluntary demographic sur survey um, that we put out there for our um, our title six um, public involvement. So if you have a moment, it only takes about one minute um, to click on the link. Uh, I actually provided a direct link in the webinar chat, and you can just click right on that and take that demographic survey to wrap up the evening. Um, that would be wonderful. Um, and I do want to mention, I forgot to do it at the top of the meeting, but I do want to mention that we had um, we had about 16 attendees at at the most during the the um, the presentation. We're down to 12. So <laughs> thank you to those dozen of you who, who hung with us. Um, I know I there may have been a couple of questions that we didn't get to. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to me and um, I'm more than, than happy to follow up on those, clarify anything, um, you know, so, so please do that and you know, thank you very much for your time this evening. We really appreciate it. We appreciate your your feedback. Um, we've gotten a lot of feedback on this this project so far, and and we really hope that you can see how how we we've, we've taken that feedback 
and put it into this project. So thank you again very much and um, have a great evening.